I wanted to start today's with a little bit of, I suppose, uh, an update about uh, being reminded yet again of the importance of our environment, not just for us, but for all living creatures. And if you remember that uh, this time last year, some pretty bad bushfires started and months down the track, so many millions of our wildlife were destroyed along with their habitat. And one very, very devastating impact was on the koala population. Now it's been drawn to my attention and why I've shown this map here is that so I can show you how it is part of a generally larger treed reserved area where it is habitat for koalas as well as other native wildlife. Many birds, uh, kangaroos, wallabies, possums, I mean you name it. There is a lot of very distinct um, insect life in these areas too. And if you actually went to an ecological standpoint of it, is that the trees in this area would be unique to ones, you know, perhaps on the other hill. Unique in that they become a subspecies all of their own. They adapt to that unique environment. Those that are up on top of a hill and subject to more harsh environments actually adapt and become subspecies. And I know this through the um, studies that I've done through TAFE and university to do with plant science and uh, plant adaptations and genetics. I mean, we look at plants as being something that doesn't move, you know, that it's rooted in the ground. But if you look at time lapse of plants, you can see that they are very much alive very much using sensors around them in the environment to navigate. Uh, it's just a little bit different to what we do. So all living things in our environment are important for the balance. And it has been confirmed that uh, this land parcel behind that will give access to the caravan park block on this side, which is pretty much sort of like that area. Now, if they've got access to this whole treat area here and they plan on clearing a large majority of that to perhaps put in a caravan park, I don't know, this is all hypothetical. I mean, people like Benyini Nyinini make fun of me because, you know what, it's a work in progress as you piece together all the puzzle and the pieces, see what picture it forms. Yeah, you get some, some things wrong, but you also get some things right. And the things that I have got right, well, that's on paper. You can't deny all those things. And uh, yes, I don't want to spend too much time. I don't want to make it an hour's video. This is important koala habitat. It is important for the wildlife as well and it is a conservative factor in the environment to leave the trees standing. If it ends up looking like this side of the hill where uh, I mean the koala is just getting less and less. I mean it, it, it's, it was devastating enough at the beginning of this year to see the photographs coming out of the koalas that actually survived. They can't move and get away from especially fast moving fires like most other wildlife can. They are pretty much hopeless, helpless. Uh, yes, they can hit the ground and start to move fairly quickly, but they are still not, you know, that fast at moving. So if there is a threat of fire in the area, 
they can't um, easily get away. And another reason too for um, actually saying that this area doesn't want, they don't want people to build on it is because of the fire risk hazards. And I dare say a lot of that has actually been created by this, look at all the areas of plantation pine. Now you see, I'm sure that there are members of the larger community that if you every weekend, you know, spend a little bit of time going out there and clearing away some of that plantation pine and doing what I've seen done here. They fence off the area for a couple of years so that the young natural um, plants that are reintroduced back into the environment have a chance to establish. Then when, once they get to a certain stage, you take down the fences and it becomes part of the rejuvenated environment for the wildlife as well. And if you did that little by little, imagine how much you could actually get achieved over the years that nothing's been done. But anyway, I'm going to move on to the next one now. I just wanted to warn people that if they want to touch any of those trees there, it'll be... Um, over koala's dead bodies and mine so yeah just a thought for the boys up on nightcap and your mate that um well what show is your mate just hang on now we're going to get there in a little bit of a roundabout way because i'm going to go back to this post that uh, i mentioned in the previous video now I brought up this post in which Mark McMurtry had uh, responded in a comment in and I've actually got a permalink that I'll leave in the description under the video along with other links so that you can go directly here and find it yourself. So it's actually under Donna's comment that says the latter. All right, so you go down, you open up the comments on that and you get down here to where, uh, here we go, whoops, go back up, that Mark McMurtry has this post that says that the developers have bought uh, the land they have paid for it. They have paid the liquidator and the liquidator is now going to pay out creditors. Now, see this little thing down the bottom here? Missed that. Let me show you what that is. I noticed it <laughs> this time because of the Vincents up in the top right hand corner. That's the liquidator who is handling Wollumbin Horizons and selling the land. So let's see. I mean, he attached this image to the comment and it says, Notice to creditors and interested persons. Re Wollumbin Horizons Proprietary Limited in liquidation. In brackets, the company. 3222 Kyogle Road, Mount Burrell, New South Wales, in brackets, the property. I refer to my previous reports and circulars to credits oops, and interested persons in relation to the above mentioned company and property. I confirm that on Wednesday, the 18th of November 2020, settlement was effectuated. <laughs> For the sale, that's a big word, I've never even heard of that one, affected, yeah, effectuated, yeah, okay, was effectuated for the sale of the property to NCV Enterprises Proprietary Limited. So there you have it, the receiver that sold the property, confirming that the property was sold to NCV Enterprises. We're going to get on to that in a little bit. So the following sums have now been received for the sale of the property. Full settlement proceeds of two million for the sale of the property and a further amount of fourteen thousand four hundred and thirty eight dollars and thirty six cents to the agent's trust account representing additional costs of settlement. Fifteen thousand four 
Yes, the longer it's drawn out, the more money that Stephen Starts has made out of this too. I will now commence the process of adjudication. Oh, he's a judge now. He's going to adjudicate on the claims in the matter. And if you have any inquiries, please contact Damien Davis. So basically, dated the 9th day of November 2020, signed Stephen Starts, liquidator of Wollumbin Horizons Proprietary Limited, in liquida liquidation and receiver of the real properties situated at 322 Kyogle, Mount Burrell, New South Wales. Actually, he needs to change that because he is no longer the receiver of the real property because it now belongs to NCV Enterprises. So that's a little bit of a correction he needs to make. So Mark McMurtry not only provided confirmation that the developers bought back the land, but he also provided evidence that it was through NCV Enterprises. So I'm going to show you NCV Enterprises, but before I do, I've uploaded all the searches, uh, the ATSIC extracts for the companies. There's 25 plus uh, a lot on Wollumbin. I have did have them all in one folder, all the searches, but then there was so much uh, information to do with Wollumbin Horizons, all the different court cases and judgments and all these different things. So I decided to make a Wollumbin Horizons and put pretty much everything associated with it inside. So if you're looking for even basic information on a lot of the people involved with it, that's going to be inside Wollumbin Horizons. There's a lot of uh, extras inside that folder. And the other is just sundry information. There's certain companies that I've looked at that I don't feel the need to uh, search anymore because I think that you're looking at low-level players and not necessarily anyone that knows what's going on. And others, it's, uh, yes, I will still need to have a look to see if there's further connections there to the members. So I'll leave links for these not only to the page so that you can go and select other things as well but also um, to uh, drive org uh, drive org a uh, google drive i uploaded this file to google drive as well i was having issues uploading it to here so i thought i'll blow it while it's doing there i'll do it to up um to drive too so now let's have a look we've seen from the letter here that it's NCV Enterprises. So let's have a look at NCV Enterprises. NCV Enterprises. Oops. Sorry about that. Should have paused. NCV Enterprises, as we can see, that Cherie Francis Stokes is the sole director and secretary. Now, the shareholders of NCV Enterprises is Yudaki Capital, Derek Zillman and Michelle Zillman, Nyepi, Jess Holdings, and Winner Super. Now, these last two, they've only got uh, very small shares and they've only just been recently added and both of them are from the Northern Territory. Maybe they actually help to pay for the purchase price of the $2 million that is now going to be apparently distributed to the uh, creditors, which includes investors. So it will be interesting to see whether Stephen Starts actually does disperse funds to past lost investors. But anyway, we'll get back over here to NCV Enterprises. As you can see, the shareholders, the people owning NCV Enterprises, is Yudaki Capital, Derek and Michelle Zillman, Nyepi, Jess Holdings, and Winner Super. So, 
I'll pause while I bring up the next one. Okay, so here we have Yadaki Capital. And in here we see that Mark McMurtry and Derek Zillman are directors and Derek Zillman is also the secretary. From that we also see that the owners are Zillman nominees, Nyepi and First in Time. So let's have a look at those ones. Right, so here we have First in Time, Sole Director and Secretary, Mark McMurtry, Sole Shareholder, Mark McMurtry. So First in Time is Mark McMurtry. All right, I'll bring the next one up, hang on. Now all these pages I'm actually showing are summaries of the extracts. So all the extracts will verify the information that are in these summaries. So now we have the other one, Zilman nominees, sole director and secretary, Derek John Zilman, shareholders, Derek Zilman and Michelle Zilman. So next one. Ah, the infamous Nyepi. This one's got lots of shares in companies. And from all the dating of everything, it was changed over from the previous sole director and secretary and shareholder on the 8th of August, which was six days before Adrian Brannock's final bankruptcy hearing while under service of a bankruptcy notice to avoid Nyepi being taken by the bankruptcy. So Nyepi is Adrian Brannock through his wife because you can't put anything in his name. But there's even special things in the uh, criminal code and everything now where uh, you cannot hide behind, oh, you know, my husband made me do it. <laughs> And it is accepted that a husband and wife can actually conspire together with criminal outcomes. So, yes, unfortunate for Christy that she's kind of, you know, because she's married to Adrian, she's, um, she's an, an enabler, complicit in enabling him to transfer his shares. They both live in the same place. They, yeah, <laughs> husband and wife. It happens, and uh, though, well, she's hiding it for him. She takes as much responsibility for doing it. So we've found out here that Yudaki Capital, through Zilman nominees, is Derek and Michelle Zilman. Through Nyepi is Adrian Brannock and, well, Christy Brannock. And first in time is Mark McMurtry. I don't know whether he wants to share any with his wife, but whichever wife he's up to by now. Now, just hold on a sec. So here we are back at NCV Enterprises that has just purchased 3222. And Yadaki Capital, as I've showed, represents Mark McMurtry, Derek Zillman, Adrian Brannock. And over here in NCV, we can also see the exact same things reflected in Yadaki Capital, Derek Zillman and Yepi Adrian Brennock. Jesk Holdings and Winner Super, I don't know too much about that. They've only just been recently added after I searched them and found out about it. And there were other ones that I wanted to utilize my free searches on. <laughs> So uh, who they are, they're minor as far as they're people that have been convinced that you know they can purchase into the nightcap on Minjimbal through the NCV Enterprises, which is the developer company for it all now, and they can have a share of it. And they actually manufactured shares to give them for that. And if you notice here too, is that there is only a thousand and ninety-one shares 
but they've allocated a thousand forty five forty five two and one see this two and one for these two at the end here have been added on but it still doesn't add up that's why I've got it here in red that that should be a thousand and ninety three shares not a thousand and ninety one now I did verify this with the ATSIC extracts it definitely says a thousand and ninety one and it definitely allocates the shares this way it doesn't add up but then there are a couple of other peculiarities that I've well one in particular that I've noticed but I won't bring that up here because I'll, I'll get too sidetracked. So as we can see from everything that I've just shown you is that it most definitely, as Mark McMurtry said, the developers have just paid for the land, as in CV Enterprises, and easily shown to be Adrian Brannock, Mark McMurtry, Derek and Michelle Zillman, and Cherie Stokes. Because uh, as director and secretary of the company, she's also responsible, as are the director and secretaries of any company. They have the special position of being in trust for the shareholders. So their actions are held up to more scrutiny, not less. Now while I'm talking about Mark McMurtry, I came across a video of his from 2008. And it was rather interesting because it looked like it was done at something near Nimbin and it was kind of like a, an Aquarius get-together. And uh, there was, Aunty Viv was introduced in there. For those I've been talking to, is that the same Aunty Viv, I wonder? <laughs> anyway, the thing was that Mark McMurtry did a lot of talking there this day. And usual talk, talk, talk about his, you know, his sovereignty and, oh, the British this and this, that and the other. But he started saying this very interesting thing about where, now I'm reading off notes here, right? That the British Parliament established a trust in the late 30s. Sorry, mid 30s. That was his. <laughs> Tons of money went into it, unencumbered funds. In the late 30s, when the people establishing the World Bank need unencumbered funds, the Indigenous Trust was unencumbered funds and they've used that to fund and run the World Bank with. And here's the interesting thing that he said and I thought that's really weird that the Australian Indigenous Trust should be administered by Maoris. New Zealanders, it's like... Wouldn't you think it would be administered by an Aboriginal representative, a tribal representative, not Maori, from New Zealand? But I'm mentioning that simply because it has come up in other conversations about where it's not so much about uh, Australian tribal people is that the Maoris have control. And it's like, well, this is a bit weird, bringing in the Maoris. I've, I haven't heard this before. But anyway, so the story is that in the late 30s, it was an unencumbered a lot of money and that the administer of those funds was a Maori. And on the 8th of August, 2007, at Uluru, at this big fancy ceremony and circle, that they decided that effectively on the 30th of June 2009, the account reaches maturation. And the World Bank were given notice 
on the 1st of July 2009 that those funds must be transferred or made available rather to the account holder on 8th of August 2009. Sorry, I've got dates a bit mixed up here, but I wrote them down as he said them. Maybe he's got them. Now, he said here there was 9 trillion US dollars. And he said that after they issued this notice on the World Bank, there was a shudder late August, early September through the world money market because the World Bank had just got this notice and they wouldn't accept US dollars. It had to be in gold bullion. <laughs> yeah, so, and then he's saying that um, because it can't be paid out that they'll bankrupt the government. So it was an interesting thing that he brought up that one, that it, this thing exists, does it? I don't know, but you know, we'll never really know the truth of it. But if it does exist, why would he claim that a Maori is in charge of it? These are in Australian indigenous funds but clearly not for Australia because, well, did it come from Australia? If a Maori was appointed by the British Crown to be in charge of it, maybe it was always just for New Zealand. Who knows? Don't know. But the thing being that he's talking about these things as if it's a gotcha moment. It's gotcha, we got you that, you know, you have to give all this money back. And because I said it, and because I'm sitting here saying it, and because I said that everything I do, you know, they, oh, well, they couldn't say this. No, they couldn't say that because most of the time he appears in court, his evidence is rubbish, and they don't even address it because it's rubbish. And that's why they can say, well, nobody said it wasn't valid <laughs> because nobody validated it as worth listening to. But anyway, I'm going to get on to the next thing. Now, this next thing is associated with a post or an article done back in 2012 and a statement made by Mike Michael Anderson, coordinator of sovereign union from Ballina, New South Wales. Now I'm not going to read it out here. I've left a link in the description and if you do have problem like uh, I know other people have had problem accessing this, I've turned it into a PDF and I can send you a copy if you can't access this. It is a very interesting read because it actually puts forward a lot of issues surrounding Mark McMurtry, the OSTF. Like there's a woman sitting in jail right now that was um, only made things worse for herself. One, that she was actually involved with the OSTF and um, got conned by them. But then when she got caught, went to court and then... Yeah, they show up and make things worse and yeah she suffered more for it in the end she turned around and said I don't want to see any of you I don't want to know David Cole I don't want to know Mark McMurtry you have just made my life miserable in hell and the woman is doing the time for being naive and I suppose yes People take advantage of others' weaknesses. This is what people like Mark McMurtry do. Adrian Brannock, Mark Darwin. These are all people that manipulate and take advantage of people's weaknesses. And somehow they'll find a way to try and pin it on other people's weaknesses. Especially, yeah, if they've... They seem to have figured out a way to get around a lot of things. But there have been payments that were made from the Wall Trust account to foundations that don't exist. 
and yet everybody says all oh, those foundations are associated with Mark Darwin. But you can't find any evidence of that even where they're supposed to be registered as a legitimate foundation should be. Then you find videos of Mark Darwin talking about how they've found this way to set up NGO foundations where you can pretty much do anything and everything through these foundations. You don't have to fill in a tax return. You're not answerable to the ATO or to ATSIC. There's, as I've said, there's only one little flaw to all of that. Once you have been recognized as a legitimate foundation, you know, if that was legitimate, everybody would be doing it. And it's, it, that's why there's the ACNC. You have to register there as a foundation, as an NGO. And if you are not registered there as an NGO, well then everything you're doing is with an unregistered NGO and not a legitimate activity. You first have to put yourself up to scrutiny before you can turn around and claim I'm a non-profit, non-government organisation foundation. <laughs> it's, you can't just go, oh yeah, I'm doing it and done. You have to validate your position. Anyway, hang on. So it's been identified who's been involved with Wollumbin Horizons. It's been identified who's involved with NCV Enterprises. It's also been confirmed that NCV Enterprises is the developer manager company, if you want to call it that, for the nightcap on Minjimble in development. And we have seen that NCV Enterprises has just purchased from Wollumbin Horizons through the liquidator the same property that goes back to members and makes it an illegal Phoenix manoeuvre. See, until the contracts were signed and money had exchanged hands. You see, money has to exchange hands. I don't know how many people of you you know, years ago, you'd watch all these different shows of cops and everything and they can't do anything until money exchanges hands. Until, I remember watching this thing on uh, when, oh, they were trying to catch people that were taking out contracts to kill people and they would not act against arresting them until at least they had paid over some money which was uh, basically concreting the intent into an actual con contract. So the exchange of monies is an extremely important issue. And before the exchange of monies, there was no actual evidence that it was an illegal Phoenix manoeuvre. But now there is. Not only is there evidence that it is a now an act, because until they actually paid over that money, it was all hearsay, you know, <laughs> but now it's not. NCV Enterprises, which is Mark McMurtry, Adrian Brannock, Derek and Michelle Zillman, and Jessica and uh, Winner Super and Cherie Stokes and Philip Dixon. He's he's there in the background, you know, he always they're all associated together, but then Philip Dixon is largely the Mount Burrell commercial, which is another area of their expansion, isn't it? And I mean it, a very good point too. I mean when I heard them talk about wanting to set up a pub, it's like, are you kidding me? It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Well, not that it is, but as far as the number of people that would show up at the pub to support it, um, you know, it's not Yukai. 
it's a little bit further down the road and Yukai is fairly close and accessible that's why that little shopping center has grown up a fair bit but I don't think that you've got the population in the Mount Burrell area to actually support that kind of activity so anything that they're going to build is going to be based on the philosophy that they're going to draw in the tourists it's going to be a tourist attraction and I suppose this is where their promoters like Don Tolman and Tyler Tolman and Pete Evans and Max Egan and Samantha Backman and all the others that's where they all come in they bring in the tourists as well as well you bring in the people that oh yes I'd like to go and have a look they're not really in a serious position to do anything about it but you know word of mouth is the best paid advertising it's also the worst advertising if it's bad word of mouth <laughs> anyway I think that I've covered enough in the uh, this time and I don't want to keep going on forever it's probably already long enough I didn't want to make it an hour long so I just thought I'd correct a few of those well not correct update a few of those things about NCV is most definitely confirmed to be the purchaser of 3222 and as I have shown that they have just bought it back for themselves it's why they have continued to sell it and promote it even when it was under contract but only once they got it at contract and NCV Enterprises signed on that contract to say yes will come up with the money it's ours now did they actually start selling it and flogging it off for all it's worth and I dare say they've got a fair few my expansions in mind and uh, yeah Benyini Nyini don't worry we'll figure it out as we get there stumble across your feet and all your little faux pas that you make but really I I mean not only did you post a confession that you've illegally phoenixed it back to the, yourselves but you actually posted the letter that showed that because you were actually trying to prove your validity to people that were questioning your validity because some other guy yeah he posted this document that yeah I honestly this Christian crown I don't know why he posted it that it's got yeah it's just weird um, don't know what it's supposed to mean you can have a look at the post that he made if you want but this one's the one that interests me that it is confirmed NCV Enterprises phoenixed back to the developers from one developer to another developer who is the same developer as the previous developer yes very interesting isn't it you wouldn't have thought they'd made it so easy I wonder what the catch is though eh? yeah there's usually a catch which means must be missing something we'll see what that is and just keep following all the leads and see where it leads because I'm sure that um, Mark McMurtry is going to make some more posts and tell us some more information about what's going on and even how he believes that they were so gracious Mark McMurtry and Adrian Brannock as the developers to extend the settlement of purchasing the land back to themselves so that they could um, watch people take court action <laughs> oh the guy's an idiot while he's at it too Mark McMurtry could you answer Donna's question you know you're a white fella you're, but you're a black fella um, 
Are you the first black fella to ever be adopted into another tribe? Why did you feel the need? Why did you not feel f- for, feel fulfilled within your own tribal history? What well, wasn't it good enough? Did you have to go somewhere else and get it? Yeah. You know, I think she's actually got a point. If you actually had the connection, you wouldn't need to go and adopt it because it's already there. You are just one big fake. Trying to justify your own self-bloated importance by even this, read the post, this one here. This uh, Michael Anderson really does tell what he thinks about the shonky dealings of Mark McMurtry. This is a guy that was actually thinking that he was on Aboriginal Australia's side until he figured out that, as he says here, that pretty much working for the British monarchy is working to undermine the interests of tribal Australians. And I will call you Australians. We're all Australians. You know, whether you want to divide yourself off, we are first one country before we are smaller groups. And ultimately, I see it the way that a lot of people are seeing it, is that Mark McMurtry is going in and whatever you're signing is somehow signing away your rights that you already have and making restrictions somehow. And yes, it does have something to do with the British Crown. Something that may not necessarily be the British Crown itself, but the British Crown Prosecutor. Uh, Jeff Pross or what uh, the name's in the article here anyway there are ties to the British High Court and prosecutors and all Crown prosecutors and all this this is where they're getting a lot of their legal jargon and hoity-toity ideas from so I'm going to finish on the note that uh, This letter from Vincent, Stephen Starts, is calling to anyone, creditors and interested persons in relation to Wollumbin Horizons and 322 Kyogle Road to basically contact and confirm your position in the matter. If you have not received one of these letters, uh, well... I hope you hear it from this video. You need to contact Stephen Starts and put in your claim as part of everything that he is going to adjudicate. And that should actually then, if it doesn't match up with what the court ruled on in the first place, he will need to seek to the court to actually change the payout distribution and the creditors. But he's also under obligation to actually make sure that all the debts are verified and valid and that the creditors have a legitimate claim. So if there have been ones that have been companies that have been deregistered and everything, It would be very difficult at this stage to actually process payments to companies like that or to individuals that were once responsible for them like Adrian Brannock or um, who was the other one? Rainmaker Eco Investments which was Philip Dixon, Adrian Brannock and Mark Darwin. So uh, yes, it's not going to be as easy to pay out to justify these debts if more people are making it 
a question of are they legitimate debts, are they legitimate creditors. So if you haven't already put into Stephen Starts, I suggest you do so and you get in as much uh, evidence to back that up because he should then take that to the court and show your claim as being verified. If he doesn't verify your debt, well, we'll see how he goes. There are too many watching to see how this liquidator is going to handle it. He needs to be seen to be doing the right thing because he's only just starting out his career as a liquidator. He's not even registered with the legitimate recognised body to have oversight over the way he does dealings. And I've noticed from searching that he's actually got a few current ones that he's also handling the liquidation for or attempting to handle the liquidation for. So it looks like he's starting to get his, trying to get his reputation up as a liquidator. And if his reputation does precede him correctly, these are companies that we should be looking at too to see what kind of activity they've been up to. <laughs> the, the, yeah, I mean, let's face it, you, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that and I'm going to catch you on the next video. <laughs> see ya.